A man's malehood is tied to his plumbing. That is, the biology with which he was born that establishes his male identity. Then that male becomes a boy. Boyhood is tied to dependency and immaturity. So we got a couple of hoods. We got malehood, that's strictly biological identity. You've got boyhood, which is dependency and immaturity. But the goal of malehood is manhood. And in the Bible, manhood is defined as responsibility under God. That is, from God's point of view, a male has not fully arrived to be a man until he's operating under the rule of God in relationship to God. So the question is, which hood are you in? Just malehood? Immaturity, irresponsibility, boyhood, regardless of your age. You still hold it on to your mama's apron string? But then there is biblical manhood. God called for three conferences a year. Three men's conferences. We just have one. Three times a year, all the males in Israel are to come before the Lord their God. There were to be no exceptions, no females allowed. Only the males, all of them, were to appear before the Lord God three men's conferences every year. Why did he call only the men? The man was created first because God would hold him ultimately responsible for that which was put under his care and in his charge. So manhood is tied to responsibility under God. The absence of that diminishes authentic manhood. Now, why did God call this meeting? Why was this meeting, three men's conferences every year, called by God? Let me show you something in chapter 34. He says in verse 10, Then God said, Behold, I'm going to make a covenant. Verse 14, for you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. Verse 27, then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. And then at the end of verse 28, and he wrote on the tablet the words of the covenant. This is a word that you've heard me bring up many times, and it is the key word to define our relationship with God, and in this case, the man's responsibility under God, all the men. The word covenant means a divinely created bond. It was an officially established relationship between God and his people. And the word that God would use about an official relationship is the word covenant. He would covenant with us. God called all the men of Israel because he was establishing an official protocol, an official relationship that was to be 
authorized to the men and then spread out from the men to that which was their responsibility. That's called a covenant. Covenants are always official. They're not casual. They're in the spiritual realm. They are the mechanism through which God favors flow. His favor flows through his covenant. A synonym for the word covenant is covering. A covenant covers. As I've defined it before, it's like having an umbrella in the rain. The umbrella covers you. Doesn't stop it from raining. It just stops it from raining on you because you are covered. Now, you can have an umbrella but not be under it. Well, even if you are in the covenant, if you are not under the covenant, you go uncovered. So we have a generation today of uncovered men. They may go to church, they may be Christian, but they're not covered. And if you are an uncovered man, that means it's raining on all the folk in your life too. Because you're uncovered, they're getting wet. God called all the men to covenant with them because they were to cover not only their own lives and their own family, but in this context, the whole nation. So the question on the floor was to bring all the men in alignment with the covenant so that they would be covered by God so that that which they are responsible for in the covenant would be covered too. So the positioning of a man underneath God's covenantal covering would determine the well-being of the whole nation. The issue of the covenant is alignment. See, a lot of men are pushing buttons, cussing and fussing. And not, nothing's opening. The wife not changing, the children not changing, the career's not changing, but they pushing all the buttons and God is saying, I'm waiting for you to get in alignment. Because if you will get in alignment under me, you'll see some power that you didn't know you had. But because you're out of alignment and not operating in relationship under my divine rule, all your buttons aren't working. So God would call all the men of Israel to three conferences a year to get them back in alignment, to get them functioning underneath God's covenantal covering. A man is not living up to his manhood if God can't tell him what to do. If you can overrule God, if God clearly says this and you say that, you have said, you're not my boss, man. I'm the man. I make the final decisions. You only come when I want you. You do not tell me what to do. Now, everybody know men don't like folk telling them what to do, including God. Because plenty of men, when you say God says this, will go, but I think, but I feel, but I ain't into that. Okay, tell your boss that tomorrow at work. Adonai means I'm your boss man. I am the one who sets the governing guidelines for your decisions. And he says, I want all three relationships with you. I want to be your power. I want to be in relationship. And I want to have the right to overrule you. If God can't overrule you, you're not a man as far as he's concerned. You're a punk. Because you've not given him permission to be God over you or me. Whenever we buck him, whenever we buck him, we step outside of the covenant and we're no longer covered. No matter how much church you go to, no matter how much religious uh, uh, you know, talk you talk, 
If he doesn't operate those three roles, your power, your relationship, and your ruler, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3 says, God the Father is over Christ. And then it says, and every man is under Christ. So if you name the name of Jesus Christ, if you declare that you are a Christian, that means that you are to be operating underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ, which means Jesus Christ has the final say-so over your life in every area. There is to be no area where he can't overrule you. Unless Jesus Christ has the final say-so, he is not Lord and you are not covered. And then it says, a woman comes underneath a man. But a woman is supposed to only come underneath a man who's covered. So that she too is covered. Because if he not covered, it's a good chance she not covered. And so he called all the men to be under the covenant or under the covering. Psalm 25, verses 12 to 14. Oh, this is sweet. Watch this. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should go. His soul will abide in prosperity. And his descendants will inherit the land. Watch this. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he will make them know his covenant. That's why Exodus 33 is so, is so critical. Verse, verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp. A good distance from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. Verse 9, whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. Verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Then Moses said to the Lord, see... You say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. I need some more information, God. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, Lord, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I might know you, so that I might find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that the nation or the people you've given me. Verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And God said, I myself will make my goodness pass before you and proclaim the name of the Lord before you. You see what he did? He didn't wait for the conference says Moses built his own tent. He met with God regularly face to face because he knew the closer he was to God, the more information he'd get from God. And the more information he got from God, the better he would be able to fulfill his responsibilities in life. Too many men have failed to come under the covenant, bringing chaos to marriage, chaos to parenting, chaos to the culture, chaos to society, and I don't mean by that women don't have a responsibility. You are to be hearing from God. But you can't do that coming to church. You got to have your own tent. You got to have your own meeting place. You got to have your own regular interface with the living God to pitch a tent. The passage goes on to say that a lot of folk, when Moses went to the tent, would stand at their tent. In other words, they didn't go to the tent. They just stood and watched what Moses was doing. Don't come in and watch my tent. Get your own tent. So that you can hear God for yourself. 
Speak into your mind. Speak into your thoughts. Speak into your circumstances. He says, and God met with Moses face to face. If we could get men, pulpit the pew and back again, to pursue a relationship with God, we would find things changing in our circumstances. We wouldn't need to run and get a divorce. We wouldn't need to abandon our kids. We wouldn't need to see the culture fall apart. But because men won't come to the conference that God is setting up, and because men will not pitch a tent for their ongoing relationship with God between the three conferences a year, we never hear from God. We just hear sermons from man. God's covenant is the key to the game of life. And your proximity to that determines how the game of life works or does not work in the life of a man, in the life of any Christian, but particularly the life of a man because he's calling all the men. So it is time now that there would be no more excuses, that we do not give excuses as men why we don't have it. By getting into proximity with God, you say, but I'm busy. I don't have time. I work. I I do this, I do that, I do that. That's an excuse. How can you be too busy to meet with somebody who's going to take over your situation? The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture. That is the next thing that's going to happen. The word rapture means to seize, grasp, or grab. And it refers to Christ coming to retrieve his church, believers, who have accepted him as Savior. That is the next event on the prophetic calendar. So that is the event I want to explain to you today about the rapture, the imminent return of Christ for his people. Jesus had told his disciples, I'm I'm leaving. He's getting ready to die on the cross, rise from the dead, and ascend back to heaven. And he told them, you can't come with me now, but don't worry, I'm going to come get you. I'm going to come get you. When the disciples heard this, they were traumatized. Because for three years, Jesus had been their leader, their teacher, their provider, He had been their guide, he had been their help, he had been their deliverer, he had been their whole world for three years. And now, he says, I'm leaving. And um, I'm coming back. In fact, here's what he told them in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. St. John 14, 1 to 3 says this. Do not let your heart be troubled, because they were troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is the first specific reference to the rapture. I'm coming to receive you back to me. During this interim, I am preparing a place. That word prepare doesn't mean to like construct something. It means to make preparation for something. And I am going to come again. Now, our dilemma is he didn't say when. All he said was, I'm coming back to receive you to me. But I got to leave now. And so they were troubled. They were troubled because Jesus was not physically there. So they had to live on a promise. To understand this event and how it affects you and me, which by the time I'm finished today, your world should change. Let me show you why. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 Paul gives detailed explanation for this event called the catching up or the rapture. 
He begins in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed brethren. I, I, we don't want you not to understand this. We don't want you to be unclear about this. So Paul is saying, let me explain this to you. Don't be uninformed. Now let me give you the reasons why this event that he's getting ready to explain is going to happen. He tells you the first reason in verse 13, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. You and I would say people who've died. The biblical word that Jesus has introduced is the word sleep. Why does he use the word sleep? Because for a Christian, when you die, it's nap time. Okay? But I'll explain that in a moment. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who've died or are asleep. Now, the reason he has to say this is Jesus had promised to come back. So they're waiting for Jesus to come back. While they're waiting for Jesus to come back, some of their loved ones die who are Christians. And so their concern, well, wait a minute. If we're waiting for Jesus to come back and some of our folks have died, will they miss his return? Because they're not alive like we are. Well, that leads to another question. Suppose I die. Am I going to miss out on the rapture? So the question was, are folks who died missing out on this promise? Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed about that. So one of the reasons he discusses the rapture is to inform them about how this thing will work with folk who are already dead. Another reason, which you'll see later on in the scripture I'll give you, is because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. It can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you can't go to heaven like you are now because that environment does not fit your makeup, flesh and blood. So it is, you can't function like you are in heaven as flesh and blood. So a change has got to occur. So that's why the rapture is needed. Another reason why this rapture is important is to remove you before all hell breaks out, breaks loose on earth. Okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now he's not talking about hell. He's talking about the tribulation period. All hell is going to break loose on earth. In other words, no matter how bad things are right now, you ain't seen nothing yet. All hell is going to break loose. And that's called the tribulation. So before all hell breaks loose, wrath to come, he's going to come to retrieve his people before the wrath breaks loose. There are numbers of illustrations of this in the Bible. Remember, he retrieved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah before he rained down uh, fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. He retrieved Noah and his family into the ark before he flooded the world. He retrieved Rahab and her family into their house before the walls of Jericho collapsed. In other words, he kept them from the judgment to come by retrieving them. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is going to do for all Christians, all who make up his church. He will retrieve us before the tribulation comes when all hell breaks, uh, breaks loose on earth. So that's the concept of the rapture or the reasons for it. He introduces a word in verse 13 that he's going to speak and say something about a number of times concerning those who are asleep. Because he gives another reason why you need to know about the rapture. 
so that, verse 13, you do not grieve as those who have no hope. It affects your emotional well-being. See, there are two kinds of grieving. Hopeless grieving and hopeful grieving. Hopeless grieving is, I'm never going to see this person again. Hopeful grieving is, I am going to see this person again. Both are grieving, but they're grieving differently. One is grieving without hope, one is grieving with hope. So, I want you not to be hopeless in your sorrow when you lose loved ones who are part of the family of God. So, he introduces us to the word sleep. That's Jesus' word for what you and I call death. Well, wait a minute. If you are asleep in our normal everyday nomenclature of life, that means you're not dead. You're in a new, you're in a, you're in a temporary shift of state of consciousness. You're not, you're not dead, you're, you're asleep. You're in a position of death, but there has not been the move to non-existence. So keep that word in mind as we, as, we, as we go along. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now, you ought to see a little conflict there. We're talking about those who've fallen asleep, i.e. died, but then Jesus is bringing somebody with him when he comes. So he's coming from heaven, bringing somebody, and the somebody he's bringing are those who've fallen asleep. Well, wait a minute. The folks who've fallen asleep are in the grave. But the folks he's bringing with him, who are the folks who've fallen asleep, are coming with him from heaven. So which is it? Am I in the grave? Or am I in heaven? When God made Adam, he created a body. When he created the body, the body did not function until he breathed into the man the breath of life. When he breathed into the man the breath of life, scripture says, and he became a living soul. In other words, his body didn't become animated, active, functional until the soul was deposited in it. Apart from the soul, all you had was frame with no animation, no life. When you expire, the life principle that God breathes in, soul, slithers in some invisible way out of the body. So the body can no longer function because the soul has departed it. And that soul for the believer goes immediately into the presence of God. At the time of the rapture, when Jesus Christ descends to seize believers, he is coming with you, the you that left you when you went to sleep. Okay? So, he says, those who are living when Jesus returns, not only do you not have to worry about the folks who've already died, they're going to beat you to the punch. Because when the Lord comes for the rapture, the taking away of the saints, he says, we who are alive, if he were to come back in the next five minutes, everybody in here who's alive will have to take second place to the folks who've already died. We will not precede them. You're not going to beat them to heaven. Even though they are dead, sleep, and you're alive. Well, how is all this going to work? So he wants to give you some details. He says, here's how this works. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So at the point of the rapture, Jesus is going to leave heaven 
and there's going to be a shout, i.e., get up. Okay? There's going to be a call, a shout. So Jesus is himself. So this is a, a personal appearance. He's going to come with a shout. When he comes with the shout, it will be with the voice of the archangel. Now, the archangel is chief angel in charge. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Because remember, the living won't precede the dead. The dead are going to precede the living because they're going to rise first. But wait a minute. I thought I was in heaven because I'm coming back with him. So if I'm in heaven coming back with him, exactly what's rising? Okay? Well, you are going to be buried. But not your soul, because your soul left. Your soul left at the point of death. You are going to be buried. When you are buried, most of us will be put in a casket that's sealed, that's under six feet of dirt. But there are other people who've died who don't get buried. Some people died in the sea. Some people died and their bodies weren't put in the casket. They were just buried in the ground. You're going to become worm food. So therefore, in order to get your soul coming down its new house to live in, there has got to be a reconstruction of you. You have to be stitched back together. You have to be, you have to be resurrected in some supernatural way so your soul that's coming back with Jesus has some place to hang out. So while you are coming back with Christ because your soul went to him when you die, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's not your soul. Now we're talking about your body. You have to have a reconstructed body for your old redeemed soul. A body that can live in heaven and still function on earth. So when Jesus returns for the rapture and the shout of God is made, there is going to be a raising of reconstruction of your humanity so that you and your soul can hook up again. So you got you coming and a body rising. So the dead in Christ will be resurrected with new spiritual glorified bodies. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But that's how you will be resurrected. He talks about people, I love the end of verse 14, who fall asleep in Jesus. That's what he calls it. For dying, dying as a Christian, falling asleep in Jesus. So the assumption is that you have accepted Christ. If that assumption is true, then when you die, you will fall asleep in Jesus. He says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That, that's rapture. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, now please notice where we're meeting the Lord. We're not meeting them on earth because it's not time for them to come to earth yet because we're going to be moving back and forth from heaven to earth. Okay, so there's a two location thing. So you need a body that can go in both places. You need to be able to play offense and defense. You need to be able to work both sides of the ball. You need to be able to, you need to, be able to hang out up there and, be, and chill down here. You got, so so a, a lot of your time is going to be spent on earth, not in heaven. Okay. So he says we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians 15 
And let's look at this just a little bit closer. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all will be changed. So everybody, dead and alive, are going to go through a metamorphosis like a butterfly emerging from a caterpillar. There will be a metamorphosis or a change. He says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this Perishable will put on imperishable and this mortal will put on immortality. Okay. Everything wrong with you will change. It will be a glorified body. Okay, well, well I don't know about you, but I'd be interested to know what that body is going to be like. Okay. John says in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he says, when we see him at the rapture, we will be like him. Okay, we will be like him. Okay, so if I'm going to be like him, then I need to know what he's like so I'll know what I'll be like when I'm like him. All right? So let's rehearse Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead with a glorified body three days after crucifixion when he stepped out he was the same person who died okay he wasn't another person he says this Jesus whom you've seen they say is coming back again so you won't become somebody other than who you are so that's the first thing so it's not like you're becoming, you're, meta, you're morphing into something else. Because remember, it's your soul that's entering the body. So whoever you are is what you will be then. So this is a whole different realm coming at the return of Christ at the rapture. And this imperishable must put on immortality and it will happen, he says, in the boom, twinkling of an eye. Quickly, the dead will be sucked out of the grave, new bodies to meet their souls, redeemed souls. The souls will enter into the new bodies for their glorified existence. The rapture is the next event on the calendar before God re-enters his program for Israel. He's going to remove us out before the wrath in order to recall his people. And so he ends in 1 Thessalonians by saying in verse 18, we will be with the Lord, comfort one another with these words. If you hold a magnet to something that has iron fillings in it, it's going to suck those fillings to the magnet. Okay, you put a magnet near something that has iron fillings in it, it'll suck it to the magnet. When Jesus Christ comes back, his glory will suck up the dead in Christ. Those who have the spirit of Christ in them, they will be sucked up in their new bodies to connect with their souls for their new glorified existence. So why should any of this matter? Number one, you should feel comfort to know when you're dead, you're not dead. You should feel just a little bit better that when you're dead, you really haven't died because you've never been more alive than you are in that second because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and you ought to feel better and less fearful about death knowing that the thing you fear most is the thing you'll never experience. So it ought to make you just feel a little bit better about the uncertainty and the, the fear that comes with death. Secondly, it ought to make you want to witness so that you don't have loved ones who are left behind. It ought to make you want to share the gospel to make sure on that great getting up morning, 
family and friends that you love and care about are sucked up in the rapture, seized in the rapture with you and not left for the hell that's going to break loose on earth in the tribulation period. First John chapter 3 verses 2 and 3 he says he that hath this hope purifies himself he says when you when you know this good news it ought to affect how we live my point is you don't want to miss this you don't want to be left behind you only left behind having played church you only left behind having been religious If you're here today and you don't know for certain that your sins have been forgiven and that you have received the gift of life, you got two things that could happen. You could die or the rapture could occur. Either one are bad news for you. So if I were you, I would run to the cross where God opens up his hands and says, whosoever will, let him come and drink from the water of life freely. He offers eternal life to every man, every woman, every young person who comes to the cross as a sinner, recognizing they need a savior and trusting Christ as their sin bearer for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. Don't let another day go by and for those who are already saved, if God never blesses you with a, more, with a new house, another new car, more clothes, better job, bigger bank account, all that's fine, but if he never gives you anything else, you have a reason to praise him for your future that he has planned for you.